So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann. Welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is co-organized by the universities of Liverpool, Manchester and Liverpool John Moores University. And today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University. It will be presented by Dr. Jen Kreiser from the University of Exeter. Jen's talk is in fact the last one before we go um, into the Easter break. Our next talk will be on Wednesday 21st of April and will be delivered by Professor Brian Wood from Oregon State University. Because Brian Wood is in the US, this talk will be at the somewhat unusual time of 5 p.m. I would now like to introduce Jen. So Jen has a very nice website, but I wasn't able to dig some of the early events in Jen's life from her website. So um, since we are close to Easter, I think we will go on some kind of an Easter egg hunt and search for details of your early life uh, while um, I try to guess something. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong on anything or um, tell me if there's anything that I should probably add. So um, what I think I know is that I believe you, you did your PhD in Bristol with Hinko Ozinga and Bernd Krauskopf. Is that kind of correct? So it's half right. So I did my PhD with Bernd and Hinka, um, but it was just when they moved from Bristol to Auckland in New Zealand. Okay. Um, as part of their package for moving, um, they got some funding for PhD students mm -hmm. and were lucky enough to take advantage. But you didn't do your undergraduate um, in Bristol? Or... No, I did my undergraduate in the University of Leeds. In Leeds. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I... I uh... I met you in Auckland then, so you, you, you had just started your PhD and then finished it in Auckland. Yeah. Okay, so I think then you stayed in New Zealand for a few years. And then a few years ago, you, you came to uh, the UK, so back to the UK and um, started a postdoc in Exeter. And um, I think you recently won uh, MRC Skills Development Fellowship. And um, that's uh, your current project on um, post-traumatic stress disorder and how the brain dynamics differs uh, from patient to patient, right? Mm, yes, correct, yeah. Okay, so, but I think now um, your talk, um, as far as I understand, will be mostly on your epilepsy work. Yes. Um, so I look forward to your talk on domino-like transient dynamics at seizure onset. Lovely. Thanks so much, Eva, for that lovely introduction. Yeah, so this work um, I started when I joined Exeter as a postdoc um, in the EPSRC Centre for Predictive Modelling in Healthcare. Uh, and I was working with Peter Ashwin uh, and Krasi Stanova at Tanafova, who I'm sure many of you will know. Uh, and then it's work that I've been able to continue whilst um, I have this MRC Skills Development Fellowship, so concurrently to extending some of these ideas to consider other neurological disorders, including PTSD and depression. Um, but in generally, um, and theoretically, I'm interested in um, transitions on networks. So this is where components or nodes of the network can switch between different um, dynamic regimes or different states. Um, and although a lot of work has been done on the long-term asymptotic behavior of a lot of these systems, um, the transitions themselves are often overlooked. Um, but I'm going to be looking at these transitions um, in particular because they are important um, from a practical point of view when we consider data which we're collecting in increasingly large quantities and the data that we collect is constantly changing as it's in a time series and it's particularly brain data um, your brain is constantly active and constantly switching between different states. So I'm going to um, dive in with an introduction a bit about epilepsy as that's the neurological disorder that I'm going to be focusing on uh, for this talk. Um, it's a debilitating neurological disorder that affects um, over 65 million people worldwide. Um, and it's characterized by uh, having seizures, which can manifest in lots of different physical ways, but um, in the brain, they can be detected as abnormal patterns of electrical brain activity. And here I have my 
student James, uh, he does not have epilepsy, but he was testing out this EEG cap. And I'm going to be talking about EEG data in my talk a little bit later on. So EEG is electroencephalogram, and it just means that we have these um, electrodes that are placed onto the scalp with some um, saline sort of solution to enhance the conductivity and um, then you get a reading that looks um, something like this so each one of these um, each one of these lines here represents um, a, an EEG electrode so this uh, particular EEG recording is from uh, an individual that has epilepsy and um, we're going to revisit it um, again later in my talk but what I want you to see here is um, that this you can clearly see a change in the dynamics from this what I call sort of a resting state uh, EEG recording with these small amplitude oscillations to these large amplitude oscillations. And this is the abnormal pattern of uh, electrical brain activity that characterizes a seizure. And I've marked the initiation point of the seizure in each of um, the channels. Now, currently the International League Against Epilepsy, which I think is a fantastic name, um, sets the classification for seizures um, and so the classification for the different types of epilepsy. There are over 40 different types um, and each have different characteristic seizure patterns, um, both in the electrical activity and in the physical manifestations. But the classification of seizure activity is currently split into around three groups. So one is focal, which is where a seizure only affects uh, one hemisphere or one network of the brain generalized where it affects both sides of the brain or multiple networks and unknown. And that's sort of a catch-all for everything else. And this relatively simple classification, um, I think, completely fails to take into account the complex spatiotemporal patterns that are observed in seizures. Um, and these classifications are based on yeah, the networks that are involved, but the starting patterns, the onset patterns and the propagation of the seizure across the brain is one of the key elements that are considered. Let me see. Okay, so um, as I said before, the um, transitions um, from, for example, resting state to a seizure state, although they're important for um, diagnosis and classification of seizures, uh, for in the example of epilepsy, the transitions themselves are often overlooked in terms of um, studies due to the just additional complexity of studying something that changes rather than considering asymptotic behavior. Um, you can see that I've arranged the onset point here as um, the onset point, that I've arranged the channels so that the onset times um, lie in a consecutive order. And so we can see um, in this way, we can envisage the onset of a seizure as a domino-like cascade, where the idea is that when one region of the brain is um, transitions into a seizure state, it recruits the nodes or brain regions that it's connected to, to the seizure state as well. And this creates a cascading domino-like effect. And I'm... Um, the timings and the order um, that brain regions or electrodes or parts of the network are recruited are fundamentally emergent properties of the underlying network structure. Um, I just wanted to flag as well that um, although I'm going to be talking about epilepsy today because transition into a seizure is one of the sort of canonical examples of um, a transition in the brain. And these sorts of sequential transitions and these cascading effects have also been seen in normal brain function um, and have been implicated in terms of memory um, and general spontaneous brain activity, um, as well as transitions um, between sleep and wake states. So, that's why I'm interested in looking at these transitions and the kind of question, um, the research question that I'm interested in is what role do the network topology and the intrinsic properties of the nodes play in the emergence of these domino-like transitions and how can we characterize them and better understand them? 
So the rest of my talk is going to follow like this. So I have, um, I'm going to talk about the model that I've um, been considering. Um, I'm then going to talk about um, an escape time characterization. So we're looking at, um, when I talk about escape, I mean the transitions between different states. Um, and then I'm going to talk through an application to um, human EEG data, which is where this video um, comes from. Um, so this is sort of a, an artistic representation of this application that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and then finally talk about the transitions, um, the interplay between transitions and synchronization, which is some of my more recent work that was published at the end of last year. Okay, so this is the model that I am looking at. So I'm considering here a phenomenological model of seizure onset that is rooted in um, the extensive work by Lopez de Silva, um, Kalitsyn, Safinsky, um, and the this particular version of it um, was is in the paper by um, Oscar Benjamin uh, et al. And it consists of a system of stochastic differential equations where um, we have the intrinsic node dynamics. So here I have chosen a subcritical Hopf normal form, um, which has a bifurcation parameter of nu. Um, here is the bifurcation diagram of the noise free dynamics. And we can see that there is a bistable regime within here where we have a stable equilibria and a stable periodic orbit separated by an unstable periodic orbit. And so I'm going to tune what I call my excitability parameter um, in this bistable regime. I call it excitability because um, depending on your value of nu depends on how um, large the basin of attraction to each of, the, of each of these stable states is. And so if the basin of attraction of the um, stable equilibrium is very large over here, then it um, is more difficult to transition to the stable periodic orbit, so the oscillatory state, uh, whereas here um, it's much easier to transition. The transitions are driven by noise, which is this component here. Um, I'm going to talk about that first, but we can talk about noise. Um, so this is just um, an independent, identically distributed noise process that is added to each one of our nodes uh, and is governed by the noise amplitude alpha. Um, the coupling in here is governed by um, an adjacency matrix A. So I'm going to assume all to all coupling. Um, in my adjacency matrix. And then we have a coupling function, which in this case represents diffusive coupling. So the difference between um, two connected nodes um, and the coupling strength beta um, governs the strength of, of the coupling. So if beta is zero, all nodes are disconnected. The only par other parameter that I've listed here is this um, hot frequency or oscillatory frequency, which is this omega that falls into the um, intrinsic dynamics. Um, this, uh, in the first part of the talk, um, I'm just going to fix this um, at 20. So this is this, um, so this model is, um, it's a bistable um, network model, uh, which has noise dri driven transitions. And so let's look at the dynamics of a single node. And here I've plotted um, the real and imaginary component. So um, our z is a complex value. And we've got our stable equilibrium, our unstable periodic orbit, and our stable periodic orbit. And here we have one realization um, of the full stochastic one node system in gray. And I'm always going to start at zero. So I'm going to consider transitions from the um, resting state, if you like this zero state, to the oscillatory state. And I'm not going to consider transitions back again. I'm going to assume that they happen at a much longer time scale because I'm just interested in transition into a seizure. Um, and we can uh, write the system as uh, in polar coordinates in the standard way using um, a stochastic Ito transformation. 
Um, I want to consider the system as a potential system, and I can do that in this case. If I just look at the amplitude equations here, we can see, first of all, that the, um, the theta, there's no phase um, element in these um, amplitude equations, and I apologize that I've um, included an erroneous bracket there. And if I consider this, um, just the amplitude equations as a potential system like this, I can pull out this um, expression for um, the potential landscape, which I have illustrated here. So for those that are less familiar, the wells of the potential landscape represent the stable states and the hills represent uh, the unstable states. The hills are also sometimes called gates. And so what I want to do is I want to um, use a uh, potential theory and uh, the related escape time theory to characterize the transitions that I'm going to observe. So I assume that my realization is sort of like a jumping bean on the potential landscape that's always going to start at zero. And then I'm going to define a threshold, um, which in this case um, is going to be the unstable um, limit cycle, which is the boundary of the basins of attraction. And then as I simulate the system, I calculate how long it's going to take for my realization to cross the threshold. More formally, I can write it like this and define an escape time, which is a random variable, which basically is the first time that my realization crosses a threshold that I've now called psi, given that I start at zero. And so I can mark that time. At the threshold, I'm going to place between the unstable limit cycle, this is RC and our critical value, if you like, um, and our max, which is the um, stable limit cycle. And I'm going to place my threshold somewhere between the two. Um, theoretically, it's usually at RC for numerical simulations. It, uh, you get slightly clearer results if you have your threshold um, slightly higher up. Um, because tau is random variable, we can compute its expectation. And in this one node case, the escape time is fully explained by the classic Iron Kramer's formula, which gives an asymptotic for the asymptotic expression for the mean escape time as our noise amplitude alpha tends to zero. And uh, the expression looks like this. And we can see that it depends on our potential landscape and in particular on the height of that potential well, where our min here is our zero stable state. Uh, we can, so our V, if we go back, um, we can see that our potential landscape depends on our excitability parameter nu or the bifurcation parameter nu um, and our escape times also depend on this value alpha here as well. And in uh, this gives us a, a general expression for Iron Kramer's formula, but we uh, were also able to solve the associated Poisson problem to gain a specific analytical expression for tau for the system that we are considering here. And it's this uh, complicated thing here. Um, but what I'm showing um, here on the left hand side is a plot of the mean escape time and how it depends on the different values of nu, which are the different colors. Um, and I've plotted this against alpha, which is our noise amplitude. So when our, uh, when our noise value is very low, obviously it takes a very, very long time um, to escape. And if the noise value is too low, then you won't see any, um, if it's zero, then you won't see any escapes. Um, as the noise amplitude increases, obviously the escape time um, becomes quicker and quicker. So the escape time decreases and we get um, at some point, the system becomes noise dominated. And so you have almost instantaneous escape. What these dots show, the dots here are, the, um, are simulations of the one node system. Here, all of my numerical results are computed using a stochastic Hearn method in MATLAB. I compute 1000 realization for each point. So that's the, each set of parameter values. So fixed alpha and fixed new values. Uh, and then take the average. And um, the solid line is this uh, 
analytic expression. And we can see that the two uh, are in good agreement here. And um, this is an improvement from the uh, results that were in the paper by Benjamin et al. So what we're able to do here is to fully characterize the um, escape times of the single node. So we know exactly how um, these escape times are going to behave and how these tr transitions are going to progress. So now let's start thinking about networks or um, at least two nodes. Um, I know some people don't like to call two nodes a network. Um, so here I'm just going to show two of these um, nodes which are connected by this diffusive coupling. And now we have um, our time series shows that we have both nodes close to the equilibrium, then one node escapes followed by the other node escaping. And uh, the coupling strength here um, will govern the relationship between um, the two. And uh, this diffusive type coupling um, means that um, the nodes are trying to um, have the same behavior effectively. So in the same way as we did for the single node, we can look at the potential theory and the potential landscape in the two node case looks a little bit more complicated. Um, here we have these stable states or again the wells, which are these blue states here. Um, and there are some smaller wells in here as well. Um, and we've got some bumps up here too. To make this, this looks a little bit complicated. So to make it a little bit simpler, I'm going to look at the contour plot. So that's just taking the surface and looking at the contour plot. And due to the symmetry in the system that you can see, and the fact that um, these are actually asymptotes up to infinity, which means you can't cross these lines, I'm just going to look at the um, potential in a uh, potential landscape in one of these quadrants here. So I'm just going to take this square and plot it so it looks like this. So now I can explain what these um, wells and uh, hills are. So here we have um, the circles are our wells. In this case, both nodes are um, off, if you like, unescaped. Um, then we have the two partially escaped states or sort of metastable states, if you like, where we have these, um, where one node has escaped but the other node hasn't, and this is the opposite. And then here we have the state where both nodes have escaped. Now this is a disconnected case. I've got my two nodes up here. There's no connections between them. And so all four stable states exist. Uh, and I've plotted one realization in gray, which starts at zero, zero. You know that these um, equilibria are just off because they um, depend on the noise value. So the noise value changes the, the location of the equilibria, which we could see from the Ito transformation of the system into polar coordinates. Uh, and we cross these. Now the gates are these saddle um, points here marked by the triangles. Um, and here the, this hill is a source now. So our realization starts at zero, zero, hangs around where neither node has escaped. And now I'm drawing two thresholds, one for each direction. So the realization crosses this way, which um, means that R2 escapes, but R1 has not. R1 is still close to zero. And then after some time, um, the realization crosses the other threshold and both nodes have escaped. Now, if we crank up the um, coupling, we can see that these um, equilibria of well of this of this potential if you like um undergo bifurcation so there are bifurcations that mean that these partially escaped states disappear but the contour lines of the potential landscape are such that the realization still spends some time uh, hanging around kind of the ghost of these partially escaped states which in practical terms means that um one node escapes and then there is a so the realization crosses this threshold and then there's a bit of a delay while the realization hangs out in this quadrant before crossing this threshold in here. So we know deterministically that the only place that the realization can go is to this um, doubly escape state, but it's going to take a bit of time to get there. Whereas when the coupling is much stronger, um, we can see that there's been another bifurcation in here, actually a pitchfork bifurcation in this case. Um, and now we just have the two stable states 
separated by a single gate and the transitions are almost simultaneous. But um, you can kind of see, and I'll show you in a second, that um, the realization actually spends much longer uh, in the state where neither nodes have escaped. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so there's quite a lot of information in these graphs here, but let's look at the blue curves first of all. So um, the blue curves represent my bidirectionally coupled um, pair of nodes, and I'm plotting the escape time. So this is the time that it takes for one node to escape. I don't care which one it is, just one of them. And then this is the time that it takes for the second node to escape, given that one of them is already gone. So basically, this is the time that you spend in either this quadrant or this quadrant. And what we can see if we look at the blue lines is that when the coupling, so this is plotting the those escape times against the coupling strength, sorry. And so when the coupling is very weak, we see that um, it behaves like the uncoupled case, which is in orange here. Um, and when the coupling is very, and then the coupling increases and we get this smooth transition up and um, up to here. Whereas in, if we look at the time spent for the second transition, this drops off so that when um, the coupling is strong, the time between escapes is very, very small, meaning they happen almost simultaneously. And um, we, the dashed lines in this case are um, mathematical expressions that were derived um, using um, escape time theory. Um, this is um, looking at Kramer's escape times um, through in a multi-dimensional landscape like this through a pitchfork bifurcation. Um, so that gives this black line here and that's work that was done um, by Berglund and Gentz. Berglund, Fernandez and Gentz. Um, and they have some fantastic papers looking at escape time stuff. So we were able to use their values in this case. Um, and here we have a combination of different things. Um, this one is um, an escape, the, the uh, just classic escape time. Here we actually can use the um, the stable uh, and unstable manifolds of the gates to identify how long you're going to spend in this quadrant. And here we have, um, this is just uh, an equivalent of an ornstein uhlenbeck process if we consider just the pro um, progression of the process across this um, little cross area here. So we're able to identify um, mathematical expressions and mathematical objects that help us to understand how this is, these escape times are governed. Um, and we're able to um, use um, the single node classification that we found before. So this is that long expression for the single node escape time that I showed you before. We're able to use this to find some asymptotic expressions in terms of the uh, coupling strength for the um, uh, each of these different um, cases. So we're able to use that one node case and existing theory to fully characterize the escape times of our two node system. And this work is published in science. Okay, so uh, we've gone through a lot of theory for um, this specific seizure onset model or this model that was inspired by seizure onset for the single node and the two node cases. So now I'd like to show you an example where we use this model as a framework to capture different seizure onset patterns that I talked about at the start. And I mentioned before that we have this quite simple classification of the focal, the generalized and the unknown, um, which is relatively narrow. Um, and uh, for this work, I collaborated with um, some clinicians uh, in Australia at the University of Melbourne and um, Victoria Hospital. Um, no, sorry, the University Hospital of Melbourne. And um, what they observed were atypical abnormalities of seizure onset. Okay, so remember I said that um, here, this is an EEG recording. Uh, with a ECG, so your heart recording at the bottom. 
And this is a transition from a resting state into a seizure state. And we have this kind of characteristic um, large oscillatory dynamic here. And this is abnormal brain activity, but it's typical abnormal brain activity. So um, people uh, with this type of epilepsy, which in this case is called idiopathic generalized epilepsy. So generalized means it affects the whole brain, which is why we have activity in all of these electrodes. Um, this is very characteristic for this type of epilepsy. So it's sort of a typical abnormality. Atypical abnormalities are additional features which um, don't normally pop up. Um, and so these could be either um, changes to this characteristic sort of spike and wave pattern, or it could be um, differences at the start of the seizure, including something called focal onset um, of this generalized seizure, which means that the seizure starts in one area. And that was one of the ideas that I was particularly interested in. And it's, it, it's very important because this sort of recording is exactly what would be used in the diagnosis of um, suspected epilepsy where a clinician would take these recordings um, and then scan through it by eye and identify where seizure events have started. So you have to be sort of lucky enough to capture one in the first place and then identify or make um, an educated guess about what type of epilepsy that is or what type of seizure that is um, in terms of um, yeah, creating a diagnosis. And if you have um, ab atypical abnormalities, this can confound diagnosis. And the treatment for um, these different types of seizures and different types of epilepsies is really very dramatically different um, and could be um, incredibly uh, detrimental if you are offered the wrong one. So I wanted to um, see if we were able to use this uh, modeling, uh, this uh, phenomenological model to try and understand how some of these different seizure onset patterns might be generated. So, sorry, Jen, is it possible to, can I interrupt? Uh, I did already. Yeah. <laughs> In the previous slide, mm -hmm. could you, is there any special, uh, these are the different electrodes, right? Yes. Yeah. So is there any special organization to this, uh, how you arrange them here in this slide? Um, I believe this will be the left side of the head. This will be uh -huh. central and this will be the right side. Okay, because I could see the profiles. I thought they might not be, and then you can clearly see some profiles that belong to different, I mean, they're, they are clearly very different, right? For example, the fifth and sixth compared to third and fourth. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Oh, so you mean like in here where you have yeah these two, these two for example the one with the yeah board. yeah so um, so the the thinking here is that um, the brain is like a network but it can consist of multiple networks and the diagnosis of generalized here would be that um, electrodes on both sides of the brains show the um, seizure activity that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the electrodes do. Um, but it affects um, networks, or brain networks in both sides of the brain. And so that's why they have the generalized. If it was um, a focal, then there would be activity only in, on one side of the brain. Again, maybe not overall electrodes, but there'd be activity here. And then these, uh, the ones, for example, on um, the right here, I think is are the even numbers. Um, these we, would look if more- If we had too many electrodes, a tiny, large number of tiny electrodes, then we might see some patterns within the, <laughs> maybe, within the left and right, yeah? Um, yes, you might do, and that's one of the tricky things. Um, there are obviously, with EEG, issues around things like volume conduction, whereas you, as other you may know, um, at your brain electrical activity has to pass through um, your cerebral fluid, skull, skin, hair, to get to the electrodes that's detecting it. And so you get this sort of smoothing out effect um, or, or spreading of, of the electrical activity. And so it's harder to make um, specific locational conclusions from an EEG recording, um, which is one of the reasons that later on, I won't be talking about location so much. I'm more interested in the timing um, of these onset patterns and the um, events that I will consider do affect 
um, or yeah, do seem to affect all electrodes um, across the brain, or at least are detected in all electrodes across the brain. But yeah, there's, there's, like I said, there's so many different patterns that you could see and ways that it can affect and uh, initiate and propagate across the brain. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for an interesting question. Um, yeah, this is really is such a rich data set. Um, to be specific, there are um, 107 patients, all with the same um, idiopathic generalized epilepsy. There are subcategories within that, like six subcategories within that. Um, and uh, for each one of these patients, there are 24 hour ambulatory EEG recordings. So this is an absolutely massive data set. And what uh, the clinicians, uh, the, my collaborators, and neurologists did was to look through these 24 hour ambulatory recordings by hand and identify seizure or seizure like events and other um, little blips that they thought were perhaps abnormal. So I'm going con to consider um, events that they tagged as generalized um, paroxysms. I call them seizures here. If you want to be technical, we don't know exactly what people were doing at the time because this is an ambulatory recording. And so we're not 100% sure if they were seizures. We don't have, for example, concurrent video monitoring. Um, but um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call them seizures. Um, and each one of these events was extracted in a 15 second interval. I'm mostly going to be considering the onset patterns, um, but for the construction of the model, I will look at this whole 15 second interval. So one of these atypical abnormalities that I mentioned was called focal onset of a generalized seizure. And um, here we have one of those recordings. This is actually just, just a portion um, showing the first few seconds of one of these recordings where we've got this big long bit of resting state and then the seizure happening here in a very sort of regular way. This data um, has been um, normalized so that it's a little bit clearer. Um, and what we did was we implemented a seizure onset detection algorithm where we um, took this normalized data um, and we calculated the envelope over it and then looked at where the envelope crossed a certain threshold which is sort of equivalent to looking at when the amplitude of the um, signal crosses a certain threshold um, and we in this way we were able to identify the onset in each um, channel which I've marked with a purple dot here and we can clearly see that there is this little blip here um, in these frontal three areas and because I want to look at this in terms of domino patterns, I'm going to rearrange these channels just so that they are in this domino effect. So this, yeah, so we've got this kind of cascading activity where these first three nodes um, transition into the seizure. I'm going to say escape and transition maybe interchangeably. So here, this is my escape time effectively, or the way of measuring escape time in the data. And we have... Um, yeah, one cascade here and then um, other, another domino cascade in here. And this was clinically identified as a focal onset of this generalized seizure. So um, I extracted, um, if we extract just these points here, then we can plot them as, like I say, escape time. Um, and uh, we can plot on the uh, head. So this is a top down view of the head. We've got a nose and the ears here. Uh, and we plot the um, propagation of this seizure in uh, this kind of quite visual way. And this, uh, oh, as you may recognize, uh, is the head that I showed you in the video uh, of the dominoes um, that I'm hoping I'll be able to come back to later. I thought it was on the next slide, but it's not. So I'm going to talk about these onset patterns first of all, and then come back to the video. So, um, Having been having identified for these proxisms or these seizures, uh, of which there were over at least over 1,000, maybe over 2,000, I forget the exact number now, but there were th thousands of seizures. Um, 
what we did was we took the seizures that had been marked as focal onset of generalized seizure, um, as well as all the seizures from a single patient who had multiple seizures, um, to get a smaller subset to start looking at how we might classify some of the seizure onset patterns. And this multi-domino one here is that focal onset that I showed you before, um, where we have the three and then the other one. So I call this Instead of a focal onset, we call this a multi-domino effect, where we have um, a, a lag between two consecutive domino runs, if you like. And so that's one of our, um, that was our first kind of classification term, was how big is the lag between these two, between consecutive nodes, what's the biggest one? Um, the other um, parameter that we defined was looking at recruitment time, the total recruitment time from, uh, so that's the time from um, the first to the last, basically. And uh, when we plotted uh, our maximum lag time against total recruitment time for this subset of around 30 events, um, we saw that they formed three quite nice groups. Now, the diamonds here are all ones that have been classed as focal onset of a generalized seizure. And although we can see we get loads of them in our multi-domino, as we would expect, we also find them in our other categorizations, which were fast domino, where the recruitment time is very small and we don't have any large lags, and slow domino, which is where we don't have particularly large lags, but our overall recruitment time is um, bigger than the fast domino, but not as big as the multi-domino. Um, and so we can see that's why we didn't want to call this multi-domino effect this focal onset because it's um, it, this presents a different classification to what the clinician has identified and may indicate a separate subcategory or um, that focal onset might be a subcategory of the multi-domino effect. Um, so having identified these groups, we then um, used a generalized linear classifier, um, just a standard one in MATLAB to identify um, lines, uh, to train the um, algorithm to identify these lines between the um, groups. And then we ran the remaining several thousand um, points through uh, this classification scheme. And we can see that we don't get the um, same nice separation that we did before, but we are able to classify all of the events into these three different categories, um, which is a novel classification of these seizure onset patterns that we don't think anyone's looked at in this way really before. So having identified these three patterns, um, we wanted to know how the, they were generated. And so we set up um, the modeling framework to um, look at them. And the way we did this was to set up a network of 19 nodes using the same system of stochastic differential equations that I showed you previously. 19 nodes, one for each electrode. Um, I then, um, we need to set the excitability and the coupling strength. So the excitability is our new parameter for each one of our nodes. Um, and so for this, we um, used a measure of energy, which um, we found in, um, I took from the work by Dean Freestone, who's done a lot of work on epilepsy detection. Um, and it's a relatively simple measure of the um, amplitude of the signals. And um, I took this for each one of the electrodes um, and then um, scaled it. I actually used scale versions between um, 0.1 and 0.2. So nu equals 0.1 and 0.2, so that we were in our bistable regime, but we had the same spread of um, excitability values and then for our coupling strength we just took the standard a standard measure of functional connectivity um for uh yeah between electrodes so i should have said so we're looking at reproducing i did this for the three um different events these are all from the same person about half an hour apart as well this is one of the other fascinating things um so how does one person generate these these three different patterns. So we have energy profiles, one for each event, and um, the functional connectivity, one for each event. Because in individuals are so um, different and their uh, events are so nuanced, we wanted to look at how individual patterns were identified. And from that, we were able to 
putting these together, so the, the each pair of coupling and excitability, uh, we then simulated the model. So here I'm showing the, the three sort of experiments I did. This first row is the this first column is the data. I know there's quite a lot going on here. This first column is the data. Um, the first thing we did was just look at the excitability. So we put the different values of nu in, but we fixed our coupling all constant and we um, computed um, D is just a distance measure between the simulation, which is now the color and the gray, which is the data uh, for each case. We then repeated it in the other direct in the other way. So we fixed the excitability at constant value at 0.2, I think, um, and used the functional connectivity matrices as weighted connectivity. We then finally combined the two. And for each pattern, we identified the best fit. So for the slow and fast domino, we find that actually the um, constant coupling and actually in this case, the uncoupled case, um, gives us the best fit. You'll note that I don't have um, the electrode values on here because as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to make conclusions about the location and I was interested in the timing of these patterns. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so although the match is not perfect, we feel like we still capture the same properties from um, the patterns that we're interested in. Um, and importantly here, the excitability is the key component, whereas for the multi-domino, it's the interplay between the coupling and the excitability that is required to best capture the patterns, although the excitability itself, we can see, provides quite a large contribution. This is incredibly um, complicated, um, so here's a little light relief. Um, so this is the domino video. So for this, I took uh, yeah, I took this uh, pattern of electrodes. You can see the first three nodes here are these red nodes here. Um, and then I worked with um, a domino artist called Steve Price from Sprice Machines, who does some fantastic work, uh, really interesting machines and domino falls, and worked with him to set up this domino pattern. Um, and I, we made very sure, very careful that the timing of the domino circle falls matched the data here. And to do that, we, um, created the paths in a way that didn't identically align with the um, order on the scalp. And in particular, you can see like here, we've gone off in a couple of different directions to make sure that the timing is correct. And so um, a colleague pointed out that, well, actually, wouldn't this maybe represent, um, could you think about this in terms of different sorts of hidden coupling or hidden coupling structures? Um, which are more internal, but and then just sort of manifest themselves in this ordering in the EEG. So I, I quite like that idea, and that's something that I'm hoping to look into in the future, um, as well as sort of thinking a bit more about how to um, break down the complexity that we saw in a sort of systematic theoretical way, where we look at um, different motifs, um, escape times in different motifs with different um, heterogeneous coupling and excitability properties, because there's quite a lot going on there. Cool. And the, um, I did another pattern as well. And the full length video, including this explanation is on my YouTube channel, if you want to check that out. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I won't be able to do full justice to my most recent work, but I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview, um, where we consider another important aspect of seizure onset, which is change in synchrony. And synchrony and epilepsy have um, a long and turbulent history together. Um, but one um, particular example that um, I found very compelling was this work by Josuka et al. in 2013, where here we have an onset of a seizure um, where they concurrently measure um, a synchronization index. And what you can see is that at the start of the seizure, there's um, very low synchronization, but by the um, when the seizure onset has finished, when all the nodes are recruited, the synchronization really spikes and, and becomes very high. So I want to look at, and we I don't believe anybody's looked at before, the um, progression of a domino-like cascade of activity or sequential escape 
and synchrony change. Now, I know that Peter's PhD student looked at, um, or his previous PhD student looked at um, within burst synchronization changes um, and were able to identify um, situations um, in particular, um, coupling forms between two, um, two nodes that led to this within burst synchronization change. But they didn't look at cascading escape. So that's what we decided to do. And so we took the same model that we had before and we're just gonna add in a couple of new ingredients. And the first one is that we're gonna add in some new phase terms. In the previous example, we were able to completely decouple the phase and the amplitude and just consider the amplitude properties and the escape times. Whereas now um, we need to consider the uh, additional phases as well. But we can see that the addition of these, um, uh, these additional phase components don't affect the single node dynamics, which I'm showing here. These are, these are similar to our previous work. But when we look at the system in polar coordinates, again, using a standard data transformation, um, we can see that um, the uh, phase and the amplitude components don't decouple in the same way as before. So now the phase depends on the amplitude here. Uh, and I can plot these deterministic components here. Again, this gives us our um, equ stable equilibria uh, of the um, amplitude system, which are our equilibrium periodic orbits, which are the same as before for now uh, in this one node case. And we can plot the phase dynamics, which gives us this, um, which gives us the shear dynamics and the point of zero uh, gradient here is a point at which the shear changes direction. So where um, the, um, the rotation of the periodic orbits shifts with respect to each other. And I'm gonna come back. These are gonna be important later on, which is why I'm showing you them now. So we were able to, these are just standard properties of the single node case. We're going to couple them together. Um, to get interesting dynamics, we need at least three nodes. So we're going to consider three all to all connected nodes. And the coupling that we're going to include is going to have um, both phase and amplitude components. So here is an uh, amplitude component, which feeds into the amplitudes of our periodic orbit. And we can see that we get the coupling strength of the amplitude component C, which is here, in um, the um, amplitude of our periodic orbits and, and our stable equilibria. M here is the number of nodes that have escaped. So as we get escape, more escapes, the um, periodic orbits are going to change as well. These amplitudes change as well. Then we have a phase component, which is governed by um, the phase amplitude epsilon. So I'm going to simulate this three node model with different values of epsilon and C. And I'm going to look at escape time in a similar way that I did before. So this is a simulation of the three node system. And now I want to have a measure of synchronization. And so for that, I'm going to choose the standard order parameter. And I'm going to look at the um, difference in order parameter between nodes that have escaped. So between the first two nodes to have escaped and then when all three nodes have escaped. And that's what I'm showing here, nodes one and two, and then all three nodes are in teal. And we can see that before, um, before anything, before our nodes have escaped, we get this very noisy dynamic. And so at the point of escape, we can see that we have um, sort of spurious um, phase dynamics. I like to call this an escape phase. Um, and so I'm actually going to choose a, a point that's halfway between the second and third escape, and then a given set value after the third escape to pick for our phase, um, our escape phases. So these are going to be the specific points that we will choose. And if we simulate the model for different values of our coupling strengths, all the other parameters are fixed in this regime. Then we can see that we have, when C is negative, we have a decrease in amplitude. When C is positive, we have an increase in amplitude. But when epsilon is positive, we have a tendency towards synchronization. So here one is in the synchronous state and you can see that in these time series. When epsilon is negative, we have a tendency towards anti-synchronization. So our order parameter tends towards zero. But the most interesting case and my finale, if you like, is 
um, that we can observe a change in synchronization during escape. So in the, when two nodes have escaped, we can have synchronized dynamics. And then when three nodes have escaped, we, that synchronization drops right off. The order parameter tends towards zero. And we're able to identify where this happens in terms of the sing, um, in terms of the amplitudes of the periodic orbits and the shear. And we find that um, we need a change in amplitude that corresponds to being on either side of the point of change of shear to get this synchronization change. Where the nodes are both on one side or the other side, then we don't see this change in synchronization. And that's um, me done. Um, I'll just uh, say that I hope that I've convinced you that domino effects and synchrony um, are interesting properties to look at on the network and can interact in many interesting ways. This last piece of work, including some of the um, seizure initiation stuff, was actually picked up by Siam as part of the Research Nugget series. Um, and the papers can be found in Science and PLOS CV. Um, future work is to look at more biophysical um, models and network models, um, as well as, yeah, sort of looking at more realistic networks. And I will thank my collaborators, of which there are many here at the University of Exeter, Theoretical and Experimental, Kong Ping, who did a lot of the simulations for the Human Data Project, um, and my uh, clinical neuro, um, neurological collaborators in Melbourne. And thank you to you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, for this talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, are there any questions? So you can either ask them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you have a question. So I do have a question right away. I think this is um, a more technical question. When you look at the escape time um, right in the beginning, you have calculated the mean escape time, but is there anything known about the distribution of the escape time? So do you have an idea how variable this escape time is? That's a good question. Yes, I do. I believe that higher moments of the random process uh, have been, well, could be computed um, and have probably been looked at before. They're not something that we've considered in this case, so I'm not Quite so sure. I'm mainly asking because um, I, I work um, on ion channels and, and usually everything um, in ion channels is, is modeled by Markov models mm -hmm. and um, you often have exponential distributions, which means that everything is very variable. So if you have um, a mean escape time, it uh, means that um, you um, maybe leave the state after that time, but um, you could leave it after a lot longer or a lot shorter. So. Um, the um, standard deviation of an exponential distribution is as large as the um, mean. Um, and that's why I'm asking. So I assume that probably they, they might not be that variable or when you when you do your simulations, mm. do you get um, really variable escape times or is it very similar when you run the same model multiple times? So, um, so here the, the mean escape time, uh, oh, I have an exponential component to it. Um, uh, oh yes, no, I have I have looked at these. So the escape times do look exponential. Mm -hmm. um, and I would assume that they would be single exponentials. Um, I could maybe see if I kept any in my um, no, I didn't. Um, but yeah, so um, we can look at how the how the distributions of escape times look. Um, and we do see exponential trends. And by looking at the um, variability, we're able to make further classifications of the domino onset times, uh, the, well, the domino-like classification, because mm -hmm. as, these, um, as the variability decreases and the mean decreases, um, which we can see if we look at the, um, Sometimes we can see if we, if we look at this, that we get um, different means and different escape times for these different cases. Um, then we can get either an accelerating or a decelerating domino-like effect um, where 
yeah, where you get less variability as more and more nodes have escaped. So again, it's this kind of progressive thing where the number of escapes then influences future escapes. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so um, there is um, a question by Veronica Biga. So she has um, raised her hand. Uh, Veronica, would you like to ask your question? Hello. Hi. Hi, Jen. And thank you for a lovely talk. Um, I, I don't know much about seizures. So I really learned a lot. And thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I was I have a kind of a comment and then sort of some naive questions for me if that's okay. Um, so I I was really struck by the your two node uh, simulations that you've shown and if I understood correctly the overall message there is that if a seizure occurs in any part of the brain it will propagate if there is coupling. Is that is that correct? Ooh, that is a good question. So it depends on the strength of the coupling, but yeah, overall, and yes. is, is the strength then making it propagate faster? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Because if I understood in the uncoupled system, they also may get stuck in one is uh one node escapes whereas the other does not but the mm. coupled system it may take uh whatever amount of time but they eventually all uh sorry eventually ends up with both of them escaping is is mm. that that seems like a very cruel <laughs> dynamical <laughs> system obviously <laughs> but, yeah that's a good interpretation. Yeah, exactly. So that that's exactly right because it's um, so because it's stochastic. You, um, you will escape at some point with probability one, but it can take a very very long time to actually see that escape. So um, yes, yeah, so again back to the the figures here where we have um, that actually when the coupling is very strong, you get very long. You have to wait a long time before anything happens. But then um, once one node goes, all like the other node goes and so if you had a larger network then all the other nodes would go and so yeah you can think of this in terms of larger networks that um all the nodes will escape at some point um it's just the timing like how long it takes for them to go might be very very long or it might be very very short and we looked at this a little bit experimentally um so uh, if you if you humor me for a minute or so, then um, we looked at some experimental data with induced seizure onset in mouse brain slices, where we have this kind of cascading activity. And in this case, we looked at a chain of um, nodes where each one of our nodes was this bistable model, and we had this um, coupling here. And what we did was we had a gradient on the coupling strength. So these two would have the same strength, but they would be much weaker than, for example, these two, which might be much stronger or vice versa. Um, and by looking at either the coupling or at the um, node properties, we were able to model different um, onset patterns. So um, this one's actually looking at the coupling strength with a gradient of excitability as well. Um, and here we sever a couple of those connections. So they're actually disconnected. So we've now created two disconnected networks, but because of the way the model is, we know that we're going to get an escape um, at some point in the other set, even though it's like a disjoint, um, like two sub networks now, if you like. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's always going to escape. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um... I, I also wondered uh, a little bit about the, the domino and the cascading effect and whether um, it's, it's all really very interesting. And again, I will say I don't know very much about this uh, area and the type of uh, data or how rich or how replicable the data is and all these um, other uh, points. I did wonder whether the cascading um, is sorry the, the domino effect is perhaps a very strong assumption however so it's the idea there that once you have a seizure wherever it occurs it will propagate to other regions and this is a sort of um 
it's not a linear propagation because they could be found elsewhere in the brain, but assuming there are connections between these regions, it will propagate sequentially. And I wondered whether one can think of an alternative scenario in which which is perhaps captured in multi-domino. So this is what I want to ask, whether in the multi-domino, you actually have multiple centers from which the seizure may propagate. So, so that would be the difference between something that um, uh, propagates over time, even the, in a non-linear way in space, whatever, because we don't see the underlying connections, or whether you can have something that um, uh, has a, a local onset, if you like, propagating to neighboring regions, but several micro seizures may be happening at the same time. The onset may be, you know, in different parts of the brain. So I wonder if you, if you want, if you comment, want to comment about that. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I find that a really fascinating um, idea, and I think it's one that isn't considered enough, really, in the um, in the epilepsy literature. So. Um, yeah, because there could very well be more, like you say, multiple onset points that lead to these this multi-domino effect. That would then have direct implications for um, treatment uh, responsiveness to treatment, um, and it could very well be that the people with that have uh, lots of these multi-domino events actually don't have. Um, yeah, don't respond to treatment as well. Or it could be that the other types of seizures, so the slow domino could initiate from this cluster and the fast domino could initiate from this cluster. So they could, like, that's not something that we, we didn't look at that location um, in the same way uh, for, the, for the confounding regions that I said before, but it's definitely something that would be very interesting to look at and would probably require more intracranial EEG um, or maybe fMRI studies um, of seizures. In terms of, um, yeah, that assumption that in our case, when one node goes, every part of the brain is going to be recruited. When one re brain region goes into a seizure, everywhere else is going to be affected. That um, assumption feeds into the fact that we only chose events where all brain regions were affected. This was just a subset of the data, albeit a very large subset of the data, um, the majority of it, but there were um, several examples and um, probably ranging in like the hundreds where there was only a um where the propagation did not we couldn't detect it in every channel for a start or that there was just a focal so there was just um activity on one side of the brain in in sort of a and these were usually shorter events as well so we only took events that um lasted for at least two seconds and um for the um whole uh, affected the whole brain region. So that was an assumption that we made. One other um, idea that may contribute to um, an initiation where the seizure doesn't spread across the whole brain is looking at in looking in terms of the excitability profiles, because as the excitability in different regions declines, they're less likely to transition into a seizure. Um, and so when we looked at this again in the in the mouse study data to um, try and tease apart some of these ideas a little bit more. Um, that's what this one was. So here we don't get um, escape of all of the nodes in the network because our excitability gradient is very large. So we've got very excitable nodes at the ventral end and not very excitable nodes in the dorsal end. So um, like we saw in the characterization of this one node, when our, um, when our excitability is low, then we can have, um, it can be very difficult to get um, escape. Um, so this is actually switched the other way around so that where we, yeah, that when new is large, the excitability is low. Um, I know it's a little bit confusing, but um, you need, basically you need more noise input to get an escape. Yeah. So there could be a case where um, although mathematically, like I say, with probability one, you know that you're going to get an escape in this case. Um, practically, um, here we stopped the simulation because it was taking too long and we only had this many nodes, um, like I think that's like 13 out of the 16 had escaped. So we, it could be that actually, um, I mean, practically the seizure could be over after a certain amount of time anyway. And so it's do all nodes escape before the other nodes turn off again. And we don't, 
because we don't consider the offset or the in, or that kind of interaction between the onset and offset um, where that's not something that we looked at here, but definitely could be something that we could explore by extending the model in the future. Right. No, that makes sense. I do have another question, but perhaps I don't want to take up all your time. I mean, if you want, you can ask this question, of course. <laughs> I'm ready. So one of the reasons I, I was thinking of the um, kind of the local um, uh, seizure onset, maybe a more of a local event that is, um, if you like, sort of poised to happen because of coupling strength, and then it just happens, is because I work with a, a, a model of coupled oscillators so from kind of our, I know you, you mentioned you don't study the dynamics of these uh, after seizure onset, I, I believe you're just interested in the timing. Mm. But essentially, we saw some, some interesting things in the coupled oscillator models, um, where just by modulating coupling strength, you can move this system from a regime where you can have some sort of local entrainment of the oscillators. So they start to, uh, by, by being completely asynchronous, and then they start to form some local entrainment. And if you continue in coupling strength, you will get to global synchrony, of course. And then beyond that, they go into, because our um, interactions are repressive, they go into sort of alternating pattern. But the, the interesting part for, for me in my work is this local entrainment. And we found that it's quite um, cool and it exists in uh, our data and it doesn't propagate to global. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what made me, uh, made me think about, you know, whether seizures are, not necessarily centrally controlled or sent controlled by a domino effect or whether it's a combination of a domino effect and and the um, um this is kind of locally being poised to start doing this and one of the one of the things about the data that you do have which is quite rich is that you see oscillations in these data sets and um uh, it will be possible. It would be perhaps possible or interesting to look for synchrony in. Um, sorry, I need to structure my own thoughts. It, whether you want to look at synchrony at the same time, and I think that's what you do. Uh, you you discussed this in the last uh, part of the talk. But the kind of synchrony I was thinking more of is just um, whether the regions you consider are um, have started. So the, the, the next node that escapes, right? So where you see the next onset, you don't define it just based on what you see in the data, but also based on um, how, how synchronous the wave coming after the onset is to the original one. So whether one could kind of pull out through, I don't know whether cross correlations or things like that, whether one could tell where um, which node would have activated next, just based on its similarity, and if and I wondered whether that would give a more uh, noisy picture of the start of onset, behaving more like a random variable, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, I think I understand what you mean. So I. Um, in terms of identifying the synchrony of like which node is going to go next, we'd have to choose a different synchronization measure because when the nodes haven't escaped, the order parameter is uh, is really messy. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'd have to define a different function to try and identify which one would go next in that case. However, the way that we arrange the the way that we arrange our um, electrodes um, does uh, depends only on this escape time and so these might be jumping around the head um, mm -hmm. as we saw here like we get so maybe the first ones in this case are a bit more um, uh, are localized but then you get a real jumping around um, across the rest of the electrodes and so um, I feel that there is a level of randomization there already and these escape times will probably um, as a uh, as following Evo's question, um, fall into that um, uh, they fall into some exponential distribution, so there may be Markov, so there may be some level of um, randomization 
in there as well. So I think some of these, there's a bit of interplay of these ideas kind of occurring already, even if I haven't stated them explicitly. Um, sure. and the, um, looking at these kind of local entrainment patterns, I, th I think that sounds really interesting. Um, and um, I guess I would go back to the fact that there are um, 40, over 40 different types of epilepsy and all of those have different types of seizures within them as well. And so it may be that um, this domino effect is a reasonable, makes reasonable assumptions for the generalized epilepsy, but not for a type of epilepsy that consists more of focal seizures, which sounds more like mm -hmm. these would be the more localized in space um, right. events. Um, like this is like a focal onset because it happens all in one region at the front, which is very typical mm -hmm. for this sort of this sort of epilepsy. Um, so that could be um, a really interesting thing to explore if you're going to look at seizure data and you could consider, um, yeah, looking at um, EG recordings from patients with, with predominantly focal seizures to identify how um, they spread and indeed how they stop. Um, mm -hmm. And like you say, it could be because of interplay of different networks. So um, yeah, you might be able to identify some yeah, networks in mean, local regions. I imagine there will be a lot of interference in this time series that, that you know there may be some relationships established in the first couple of peaks, but after that, you don't know how the seizure happening close by affected it. It, it will probably be, <laughs> now that I think about it, it will probably be quite the, a challenge to work out. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think uh, so some of my collaborators here at Exeter and, and that have subsequently moved on to Birmingham have um, considered this idea a bit more because um, when they're looking at these like local entrainments, if you like, in the context of focal seizures, it's uh, to identify where the seizure, what the trick, where the starting triggers, where these focal points are um, for the seizure, um, and there could be multiple ones, and it's about identifying um, where they are in the brain because the treatment in that case is resection, so where they surgically remove that part of the brain, so they want to find mm -hmm. the right bit. But some of the in interesting work that um, John Terry and his colleagues have done is to look at actually well it might not be the node that escapes first, might not, that might not be the driver. It might be getting signals from other uh, brain regions that um, come to, let's say the dynamics um, come together to cause that node to go first, but actually the trigger is in a different place. Sure. sure. Causing it. Yeah, and, um, and I find that idea kind of fascinating and I don't, I don't claim to fully understand this at all, but um, they've used these similar sorts of phenomenological models to try and explain that concept um, and this phenomenological model could be considered in um, it's previously been used in a way that doesn't look just at the onset but runs simulations for long periods of times where the onset goes on and off again in different mm -hmm. brain regions and then you sort and then you have a overall measure of how long the whole network spends in the seizure state during one simulation for example and in that way they're able to um, and then by removing nodes, they can then, um, based on Mark Goodfellow's work, characterize the um, contribution of each node um, to that, um, to the level of seizure, to the, yeah, how important is it in terms of creating seizures? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool. No, thank you for your questions. Really interesting comments. Thank you. Well, we have already discussed for a very long time, but um, am I allowed to ask one more question? Sure, Eva, yeah. <laughs> so so it, it might be relatively simple anyway. So um, I, I think you, you mentioned um, several times that it is um, not so easy to um, predict the sequence of electrodes that um, will be activated. And um, I wonder how um, reproducible um, that would be when you have, um, yeah, um, maybe the same patient several times. You, you said that some patients have focal seizures, so um, you have a brain region where um, the onset usually starts. But um, when you look at uh, maybe the same patient, if the data is available mm -hmm. multiple times, um, can you um, find a patient-specific pattern that would um, maybe tell you how strongly some nodes are coupled uh, in contrast to others? Mm, 
Yeah, I think uh, that is something that we started to look at and it, it seems to be a bit of a rabbit hole, but yeah, it, it's really interesting. So, um, okay, so for example, these three, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, these three events are all from the same person recorded about half an hour within a sort of a one hour window um, because the data is uh, this 24 hour ambulatory recording. So um, this would, you could think of this as multiple recordings um, over the 24 hour period. Whereas when you come into a clinic and they do a recording, it's only for like an hour or two. So, um, so yeah, so that's where we sort of see some of this variability and we did start looking at, okay, well, which nodes go first? Because um, like I've identified here, um, it's quite, you can see that it's the frontal, this little frontal group of nodes. And so then the obvious question to ask is, well, what are the first nodes to start here? And I think they are in the front as well, but they're not, they're one of these three, but not all of these three. So you don't see the same kind of pattern. Um, and we feel, I feel like there's a whole, a whole other paper in looking at and um, trying to classify that and looking at similarity across um, multiple events of patients, trying to group patients by their overall, yeah, but either, yeah, by the, the location in which they start. Um, that's, that's, that seems to be absolutely uh, another whole massive area in it. I feel, I feel there's so much complexity here that it's, yeah, it's waiting to be probed, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, it sounds that it, as if it was really complicated. Yeah, well, which is uh, why we started just very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you very much for this really great talk and um for being so patient with us <laughs> with oh, no, um, answering all our discussion. questions <laughs> so um yeah um i wish you all a good afternoon and um hopefully see you soon after the easter break <laughs> bye bye sounds great thank you so much evo <laughs>